Revolution Games has published some games that they really enjoyed in the past, Cells and Washington's Crossing, and for this reason I was very curious to try the most recent release, which is Road to Karen. Also, uh, I'm always interested in learning more about obscure campaigns uh, and wargaming is an excellent way to do so and this is one such case in which the game in fact depicts a little known conflict that is a campaign that took place in East Africa in World War II and that uh, saw the Allies going against the Italians, so not the North African campaign, uh, definitely a less known, uh, less known series of operations, and I personally I really enjoyed the opportunity of learning more about that through the game. Uh, Road to Karen, um, it comes in a Ziploc bag, as you can see, I added a counter tray, but you don't have to. Um, comes in a Ziploc bag, but uh, this is no DTP quality. The, the quality component is pretty good, it's higher than DTP. There's a nice cover as you can see, the map looks nice, the counters are glossy, uh, maybe even too glossy for somebody's taste. I don't know that everybody would like them being that glossy. But um, one thing that I want to mention is about the packaging. Uh, the game came to me in an envelope. It didn't have anything sturdy inside the envelope, like a piece of cardboard to uh, keep things from being folded and bent during shipping. And in fact, my copy was a little wrinkled. Nothing major. I really don't care, I care about the design more than about the components. But even from the point of view of the components, the damage, just, just the cover has a little, maybe the cover has a wrinkle here and there. Uh, you can't even see it, I think, or barely. Uh, I mentioned this to say that if that happens to you, uh, I've seen that some people have talked about that online and the publisher said that they are perfectly willing to send replacement copies. So if that happens to you, to your copy after you order it and the copy arrives to you not in as good a condition as you would like it to be, then no, no need to get your underwear twisted, just contact the publisher to send a new copy so you will have a beautiful copy and, uh, and a spare copy, which I think is pretty good, actually, you get two for one. In any case, uh, now let me show you how the game plays. This is the map of the game, it is printed on paper, here I place it under a piece of plexiglass. It is very simple, nice, no numbers in the access, which is unusual, makes things, I don't know, makes things look a little strange. But setup is still clear because there are some indications, some specific numbers in access where you need to set up um, things, set up units. In any case, the map is not too big. But it looks nice and everything is here here you have the combat table terrain chart turn track each box is used twice everything really very very economic here uh, but i like that it feels uh, i don't know it's very tight visually okay um, here you have the setup of the game with the Italian units scattered on the board, ready to defend, and with a large number of LED units ready to enter from Casala. This is why there is already a control marker there. The Allied player places control markers each time that he takes control of a city on the board. And uh, actually this is very important because at the end of the game a victory is assessed by uh, depending on control of cities on the map. Um, each turn the active player will go through a full sequence of events, then the game goes to the opponent who goes to the same player's turn and then you move to the next turn. First thing that the player does is to uh, receive reinforcements if reinforcements are to be received that turn and in some turns the, the allied player will also receive replacements. Then you get to move your units and movement is pretty traditional. Units have a movement value pointed at the bottom right corner of the counter. By the way, these counters are very, very glossy, very glossy, sturdy not super thick but thick enough I like them make his units move up to their full movement allowance um, different types of terrain will have different costs you need to look at the uh, at the uh, terrain table there 
and uh, several things apply. One is stacking units have a stacking value of one uh, unless differently specified. Some units have a higher value and you cannot exceed the stacking limit, otherwise you will lose units. Also, uh, stacking value will affect the zone of control. Yes, units do project a zone of control in the six hexes surrounding them, but there are two zones of control. Soft zone of control and hard zone of control. A soft zone of control is projected by a unit or a stack of units up to two stacking points. The enemy that enters such a zone of control spends an extra movement point to enter the hex, but doesn't have to stop. Can keep moving if the enemy unit has still enough movement points. A zone of control projected by a unit or stack of units with a stacking value of three or more projects a hard zone of control and the opponent still pays an extra point to enter, but also has to stop. After the active player has executed movement with any and all of his units, the uh, opponent, the non-active player, gets to move some of his units in the enemy reaction phase. So the non-active player becomes the active player for a little bit, and the non-active player can move up to three stacking points of his units. Then you have combat. Combat is resolved in a pretty traditional way, no huge surprises there. Just a couple of twists, but nothing major. What happens here is that you total the combat factor of the attacker, and the combat factor is the number printed at the bottom left corner of the counters. You total all of the uh, combat factors of the attacker. Uh, you find the ratio between that and the combat factor of the defender or defenders. You find the correct column and column shifts may apply on this table. The terrain in which the defender is defending, for example, may give column shifts. Also some units qualify as support units, for example artillery or tanks, and you total the number of points that support units contribute to an attack. The player with the highest amount of support points in an attack gets a column shift to his advantage. So you may not have the highest total in the combat, but you may still get a column shift in your advantage because you have better supports than the opponent. You find the correct column, you roll 1d6, you cross-reference and you find the result, which may be a numerical result and that is the number of step losses that the corresponding side has to take. You may receive an R, you may receive an R and that means mandatory treat, mandatory treat or you may have both a letter and an R, that means step losses and retreat. As we are here, I also want to show you another thing. These are Italian garrisons. So some units on the south side of the map are Italian garrisons. They have limitations. They cannot move at the beginning of the game. They can move only if an allied unit moves adjacent to them and, and or if a unit is an enemy unit is in the garrison area and the garrison area is limited by a yellow line. I think you can see there by that river. When an enemy unit moves uh, in one of these two places, same area or adjacent to, then the Italian garrison is released. However, at that point, the Italian garrison is also tested. Um, you roll a die, and depending on the result, the garrison may remain Italian, that means with the green stripe up, or it may defect and it may become an allied unit. In that case, you show the red, the red band there and now it is the ally player that can control that unit. Either way the unit is released and can now move normally. After the combat phase you have the supply check. Units need to demonstrate that they are in supply otherwise they will suffer adverse results and the uh, supply line will be modified depending on the terrain in which it is traced. You need to trace a supply line to a road or track that then goes to a supply source or you need to trace directly to a supply source but the line that you are tracing to the road or track with the supply source may be of three axes only if you are uh, tracing it through clear axes and no enemies also control two axes if you're tracing in an enemy zone of control or through hills and one hex if you're tracing through enemies zones of control and hills. 
and if a unit is out of supply, the first time that that happens, the unit is in low supply, uh, which will give you some penalties, but much more severe are the penalties that come from being in no supply, which is what happens to a low supply unit that is still not supplied at the next supply check. And those penalties are much worse. For example, uh, tanks and mechanized units cannot move at all, lose their zone of control, they cannot attack, pretty bad stuff. After supply for the active player has been checked, the active player can use his exploitation phase, that's the last phase of his turn, and during that phase some of his units that specifically qualify for exploitation movement can move again which can be a good way to position units, try to cut enemy supplies and things like that. One thing I didn't mention yet, but that is pretty important, is action chits. Each player has a pool of action chits that the player can use during the game. At the beginning of the game you draw four of these chits that form your starting hand, also four is the maximum number of chits that you can have. And these chits can have different effects depending on the effect described on the chit itself. After you get your initial chits, both the allied and the Italian chits go together in the same randomizer cup. That means that then later during the game you may draw chits belonging to the opponent that are useless to you, but you also get to eliminate them. Also, some chits may become useless during the game because the situation in which they can be useful does not apply anymore, but you're not allowed to discard them. So they just stay in your hand and they just limit the amount of useful chits that you can have. And some of those chits have very powerful effects, and especially if you can combine them in powerful combos, then fun stuff, pretty spectacular stuff can happen. So a player goes through all of the turn phases that I described before, then the opponent does the same, and you continue like this until the end of the last turn, when, as I said earlier, victory is assessed by uh, counting victory points that are based on control of towns on the map. I must say that recently uh, I'm really getting to appreciate small, tight, clean designs. I recently played Hell's Gate, maybe three point games, and and I had that experience, small, nice, clean, elegant uh, design, and I have the same impression uh, from Road to Karen. I had the same feeling as I was playing it. I always enjoyed lightweight gaming as a quick way to get introduced to a certain historical topic, as something you can squeeze in between larger games. Um, or anyway, something you can get started, you can teach to people without having uh, to work too much on, on, on the training session. And, and I have to say that Road to Karen has all of these advantages. It has, uh, it is easy to teach and easy to play. The rules are pretty straightforward. The turn sequence still has a couple of interesting twists here and there to keep things from being just basic standard move, attack, that's it. You have uh, the reaction phase, which of course keeps the other side interested too, uh, because the other side will have a limited possibility, limited opportunity to react to what you're doing, but trying to, um, to disrupt your plans for the attack, trying to threaten your your supply lines, things like that. Those are all things that can happen there. Uh, of course, even the player that is reacting has to make a choice because only some units can activate there. Exploitation movement has a similar as a similar uh, fact as a similar impact on the game. The terrain is challenging, and Italians, the Italians in particular, really have to take advantage of terrain. Really have to take advantage of those mountains. Um, I, I found that the Italians need to use a little bit of a guerrilla technique: uh, retreat, um, regroup, hide in the mountains, threaten supply lines. Uh, and because otherwise uh, the wave of allied units is pretty, is pretty tough to to stop for the Italians if they decide to go uh, to, to attack or to defend frontally against the opponent. So it is a game that has a lot of nuances uh, and I, I have to say uh, surprisingly so in a way since the game is so straightforward but I have to say 
the challenges that the, ma the map give you, the possibilities that the uh, rules create, the, the counter mix, the way in which units are distributed and, and come into play, all these things really come together nicely. Uh, this is not an epic experience, but uh, for a small game as, as this is, for a simple game as this is, it really gets to give you a good sense of the conflict and a lot of interesting challenges and a lot of fun gameplay. At least I didn't have any problem uh, playing the game. I was entertained and interested as I was playing the game. The uh, chits, uh, yes, these probably will work better in a two-player game uh, because there is a surprise factor, there's a surprise element there and the designer even talks about this, uh, how that can impact both practically and psychologically the way in which the game plays. Uh, in Solitaire game, however, or in, in Solitaire play, I didn't encounter too much of a problem either, even knowing more or less what the opponent had in, what the other side had in the in their hand, wasn't too much of a problem. Just playing with the with the cheats face up and using them when it made sense, and still playing both sides at the best of my possibilities, I was perfectly able to solo the game and to enjoy both learning about the topic and the mechanics and the execution of the game as I was playing it and as it allowed me to approach the topic. So, uh, light game, fun game, uh, it looks good, it looks good, especially if you consider uh, that this uh, is a game that can be acquired for a relatively low price. So, Road to Karen, to me, another good title in the catalog of Revolution Games.